a German will now feel hairy like his older brothers. There's dramatic tension because the narrative suggests that the blind e Isaac is confused. He hears the voice of Jacob, but the hairy hands belong to Esau. So Isaac does the deed. Jacob receives the blessing. The pathos is intense. As Esau returns replete with savory food for his father to eat before getting his blessing, and then Isaac begins to tremble because he knows he's been deceived. But his word is his word, and it must be upheld. Because you see, in the age of the Bible, words were mysterious, and they were powerful, like God's word speaking creation into being. You see, words once spoken began immediately to act. So a blessing that has been pronounced cannot be rescinded. That younger brother Jacob has grabbed the heel of his sibling in the womb, and now he has grabbed the blessing he wanted. Esau unleashes a bitter cry. Welcome to the ways and means of our ancestor in faith, Jacob. The promises of God go through him. Now by this time, I imagine you might be wondering how to approach a story like this. I mean, is it history? Is it historiography? Or kind of history in a narrative form? Is it a legend with a little bit of truth and a lot of fiction? Or is it just simply a folk tale from an ancient oral tradition? There's not universal agreement on the answer to that question, likely even in this room. And without live footage from the ancient world, we really can't settle the dilemma. Sure, an ancient couple could have had twins that didn't get along, and a blessing could have gotten redirected. But it's also true that there's an age-old archetypal rivalry between that impetuous brutish type and the careful schemer, the hunter in the fields and the thinker in the camp. What's more, Esau's attributes at birth, do you remember? He's hairy and he's red. These are plays on the Hebrew words for Edom and Sair, which are names for the land south of Judea. So perhaps this is a story form explanation of the relationship between the Israelites, the new kids in town in Canaan, and their southern neighbors that they supplanted. History, so to speak, written by the victors. Fact, folktale, maybe something in between. I'm not going to dictate to you how you should understand the narrative. For I don't think that's the critical inquiry for us in this summer tour of Jacob. Because no matter the approach, the stories have meaning. There are questions raised and answers suggested that probe the mystery of God and the nature of humanity. On the one hand, we can consider the characters themselves and we find patterns of behavior that, like it or not, we see in ourselves. See, Esau disregarded the blessing of his birthright just because he was hungry. A rash and unthinking response. But then, how about you and me? Do we acknowledge the blessings that God has given us and do we value them? Do we wait upon God in gratitude? Or do we allow the tyranny of the immediate desire cause us to move God's plan and provision to the sidelines? And then there's Jacob. One could argue that Jacob was merely acting upon a bargain that he had already struck with his brother when obtaining that blessing. But we recognize that Jacob's motives are hardly pure. Jacob knew he was deceiving his father. He knew he had outsmarted his brother, and he did it anyway. 
He emerged the victor, but were hardly impressed. Well, once again, he compels us to reflect. Are we really any different? We're not always honest with ourselves, with each other, and with God. Do you remember the confession we just read? We do not love as we were intended to love. We, too, have been known to allow our ends to justify our means. We, too, can look in the story like a mirror and we see ourselves. Remember what I said? Perspective changes the story. And if this all weren't enough, the story makes us wonder about God, doesn't it? I mean, God promised Abraham back in Genesis 12 that he would be the father of a multitude. God advances the promise through Isaac and then, of all people, through Jacob. The nation of Israel eventually forms through him. It's accomplished in the midst of the reality of manipulative parents, sibling rivalry, and conniving acts with imperfect people doing imperfect things, we learn God's purposes are fulfilled. Though silent and inscrutable, God works. Within the frailty of humanity, God accomplishes God's purposes. Wow! Like in the experiences of our own lives, we cannot always discern rhyme or reason. Bad guys sometimes seem to win, don't they? Life appears incredibly unfair. People disappoint us, and motives are rarely pure. And yet, God acts. Whether in the story of Jacob or the story of our lives, we need to look, we need to listen prayerfully to discern God's wisdom and God's plan unfolding because the revelation of God can come in very unexpected ways. We're not going to tie everything together today. There's a lot more to this saga with dreams and schemes and wrestling with God. But throughout, we'll discover that Jacob's story is also our own filled with unexpected events, tension, changes of plan, and moments of joy along the way. That's life, isn't it? And also throughout we're reminded that God has a plan and it will come to pass. And because it is accomplished by a God that is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love forever, we can trust that that plan ultimately is good and it is eternal. And such a perspective transforms our very own stories into ones with hope and promise and future. God's will will be done. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.